Thank you, Abed. Um, you know, a lot of people have asked me whether or not that be actual wine here. Uh, I'm quite willing to do such a thing, but I think the club will probably want um, to be re remunerated in some fashion. So this, you know, hopefully, even though we're talking about a liquid, uh, hopefully you won't find me too dry. <laughs> just have to start with something. All right. Let me just get this situated here. All right. So, uh, you know, why I should really say why do I find it such a fascinating uh, topic? Uh, because it includes so many disciplines. Uh, aesthetics, ampelography, that's the study of the shape of leaves to determine what variety uh, the, the vine might be anthropology, archaeology, biochemistry, botany, sociology, genetics, geography, geology, geology history, neurogastronomy, some people call it enogastronomy, uh, enology, making wine, pedology, the study of soils, philosophy, topography, viticulture, and a lot of other ancillary fields of study. For me, uh, it provides a string of understanding into mankind's especially uh, Western, religious, philosophical, and artistic evolution. So, you know, uh, let's not forget that it can be, and very often is, delicious. It enhances food, wine, because the acidity in wine uh, causes a reaction in your mouth to increase saliva, which have enzymes that aerosolize whatever flavor compounds there are in your mouth, and so you, quote, taste or smell what's in your mouth in a much better way. Uh, it, it acts as a social lubricant, leading to ease of conversation, hence the saying, in vino veritas, <laughs> okay? It is uh, said to free our spiritual and artistic selves, while its destructive power has always been long recognized. So the main themes today, I'm going to talk about its path from being a sacred object to a secular one. Its uh, role in branding, uh, one of the first uh, to be looked at as a brand. Um, I don't think that's my phone. No, it's not. Um, and. Um, it definitely shaped trade. One of the things that we'll look at especially is um, the role of wine and the demand for wine in England and how it really shaped the wine world until, believe it or not, uh, it was the leading wine market in the world until about 2015. Okay? Uh, so with that, uh, fortification became an essential element for wines, and I'll explain that later. Uh, the technological and agricultural aspects, I mean, wine uh, growers were way ahead of the curve as it related to uh, organic and biodynamic agriculture. Um, and wine, as opposed to most uh, ingredients that we put in our mouths, actually reflects a place, that it tastes differently because it was grown there, not just because of the physical elements, but because of the cultural elements of the people and how the people uh, saw it as a reflection of themselves and their primary um, likes and dislikes. And uh, we'll talk about how French varieties came to dominate uh, the world and then briefly touch upon what's new world versus old world versus the real world of wine. So what is wine? Wine is, uh, first it comes from a proto-Indo-European word stemming from, I have no idea how the Sanskrit is pronounced, but wino. Uh, uh, it's legally the fermented juice of grapes so that if you have any other uh, wine from another fruit, you have to label that particular fruit, peach wine, blueberry wine, etc. And the wines that we're all familiar with are primarily from Vitis vinifera. So 
the great uh, genera, there are debatable, uh, there used to be 18, uh, then there were 17, and now there may be 16. It depends on the, the biologist, botanist. For example, the genus Muscadinia used to be a species and then bumped up to a, a genera. But in any case, Vitis vinifera uh, became the selected species. Why? Because it's hermaphrodite. And so if, it, if the plant doesn't have to be interdependent with another species, there's an advantage to human beings selecting a hermaphrodite plant. Okay? The other thing is we're going to see that there are at least 5,000 and possibly as many as 10,000 different varieties. The other primary species are, I'm not going to read them all, but they're all uh, in, found in the United States, uh, the, the Americas, um, where the preceding uh, uh, progenitor of the vitis probably originated on this continent. But they play a very important role because almost everywhere in the world, you have to graft the vitis vinifera onto either Riparia, uh, Rupestris, especially Rotundifolia, etc. Um, and I mentioned here that you can have hybrids. So somebody mentioned that they went to uh, a winery not far from here and the wine tasted uh, really uh, strange. Well, that's because it was probably made from muscadine or scuppernong, and it's not the same species as vitis vinifera and what you're used to. But there are some hybrids that is where you cross, you know, say a riparia with a vinifera to come up with a hybrid. And hybridization occurred particularly uh, during the late 19th century when uh, phylloxera attacked, and I'll get into that. Uh, a lot of crosses that is within vitis vinifera, such as Chardonnay, is actually a, a cross between Pinot Noir and this uh, rather common grape that's not much used anymore called Gouet Blanc. Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, the parents of Cabernet Sauvignon or Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. So with the DNA analysis, all kinds of new information that's being revealed, especially in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. So, types of wine, light wines, white, red, rosé, and orange wines, talk about them briefly. Sparkling wines, of course, champagne being the most famous. Um, the uh, Method Rural, that's a single fermentation that takes place within a bottle. And uh, Charmat Method, or bulk, industrialized uh, forms where it's in tank. Uh, fortified wines, best known, Port, Madeira, Marsala, Sherry, uh, the Vendu Naturel of southern France, and uh, perhaps you've seen Topeque from Australia. They were forced to remove the name Port because that is a restricted um, term applying only to wines from Oporto, Portugal. Uh, and then you, lastly, you have aromatized wines that are coming back. Most of them are somewhat fortified, but uh, vermouth, dry, sweet, Lillet from France, Quinato, especially in the Barolo region of Italy, and Bio, uh, which uh, has quinine in it and also blended with Mistel. Mistel is basically grape juice, uh, unfortified, I mean, unfermented but fortified grape juice, bringing up the alcohol level to 15, 16% to prevent the yeast from uh, converting it into wine. So it's sweet, and it's part of the addition of, of uh, beer, for example. So I quickly put this in the Schrodinger's cat. Those of you that are physicists uh, might uh, recognize the term. It's about quantum mechanics, and you know, basically, if there's a cat in the box, all one can say about it is uh, there's a cat in the box and uh, either it's alive or dead. But uh, the reason I bring it up is there probably was wine naturally fermented 
uh, grape juice, uh, millions and hundreds of millions of years ago, but until human beings were born, really, does it exist? Anyway, the prehistory, uh, we know that Vitus vinifera sylvestris, the antecedent, uh, developed around 200 million years ago. Uh, there are fossilized remains of Vitus vinifera from 50 million years ago and about 200,000 uh, years ago, appearance of white mutations. But the first real human traces of vinifera use, and not wine, there's no proof that there was actually wine, but the actual seeds uh, and, and remnants of, of uh, the grapes stem from a site uh, that used to be covered by the Sea of Galilee, but it has shrunk somewhat. And um, about 20 years ago, they were working on this site that was extremely well preserved in uh, some sort of mud. And uh, they found, amongst other things, uh, primitive uh, detritus of, of the building, uh, which were made from uh, plant material. Uh, and interestingly enough, not only Vitis vinifera, but emmer wheat, wild almonds, wild pistachios, wild olive, and different flowers. So this is before humans have really settled down in an agricultural manner. Now, you know, why did anybody, uh, any human being, find wine attractive? Well, it's the same story with whether you're talking about beer or mead, that's uh, honey based with water and it will ferment and you can get uh, uh, alcohol from it. The fact is that we have the necessary receptor uh, and, and the gene was identified as ADH4, which allows us to process ethanol and to get a buzz from it, okay? Now, now 17 other species have been identified as uh, being impacted by alcohol which in the scheme of things is not that many species, but bonobo monkeys actually would search out overripe fruit that had some alcohol already in it and would have uh, quite a party. Uh, they have a reputation anyway. Uh, chimps, <laughs> birds, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, birds in especially the autumn that, are, that have consumed a number of berries and then their flight is definitely affected because it doesn't take much at all, okay? Because you know, after all, they have bird brains, and it doesn't take much at all for them to be affected. And there are other uh, uh, mammals such as uh, tree sh shrews from Malaysia. Um, but what I find amazing about human beings is how creative and inventive, because of our sense of curiosity. And to take it to an extreme in the Amazon, where there was no form of vitis whatsoever, uh, what did people do there? Well, they discovered that the secretions from what are termed monkey frogs could be scraped. Now, frogs secrete as a protective measure so that when they're being eaten, you know, the reptiles will go, Ooh, not good, uh, and spit them out. Well. They figured somehow that if you scraped the secretion, dried it, and smoked it, you had an immediate hallucinogenic experience, which we know that uh, the Mayans uh, definitely uh, catered to and uh, other uh, tribes in, in the Amazon. And, uh, you know, I just wonder how many things that human beings over the millennia tried and failed. I would probably suggest to you that 99 out of 100 times it failed. So, uh, you know, the discovery of, uh, I didn't include meat here, but wine and beer and chicha, we, we don't exactly, we can't exactly pinpoint, so what I'm going to talk about is the evidence that we have to date. You know, chicha is, uh, you know, a corn-based uh, alcoholic drink that you need, uh, it, it, it's starch, and it cannot be fermented unless it goes through the process of sacrification, transferring the, or 
um, transferring the starches into sugars that are then fermentable by yeast, which are everywhere. Um, so how did they do it? Well, you take the corn, you chew it in your mouth, you spit it out because your saliva has amylase, the enzyme necessary to convert starch into sugars. Now we know uh, that around 10 to 13,000 years ago is the most likely period that things start. And it may not have been wine for us, we just don't have evidence, but we do have evidence from Rakhfet in Israel of uh, shards of pottery that have a calcium oxalate, which is an in indication of a fermented cereal. And there are more and more anthropologists who suggest today that the primary impetus for the settlement of agricultural communities and to grow cereals was so that they could have beer, so that they could get a bus, okay? And, and it's taken very seriously today. If you had suggested this 20, 30, 40 years ago, you would have been laughed out of the room. Not so anymore. Now, why? Because human beings didn't have to do anything to it. It just naturally could occur if you crush a bunch of grapes together and the juice comes out, it will naturally ferment was mysterious. It wasn't like cereals that you had to go through certain processes through trial and error and figure out, oh man, I can get this uh, interesting, uh, probably was more like gruel, where I can get a, a, a kind of light feeling about this. No, wine, you know, had a sacredness from its beginnings and so is central to the main religions and many religions that no longer exist. And uh, so I'll, I'll take a look at that because without it, it probably wouldn't have become uh, the, the, the dominant alcoholic beverage in uh, you know, Western Europe. So gra uh, grapes naturally ferment, as I said, from Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which are ambient. Uh, that was understood until the 1860s by Louis Pasteur. And one of the key elements was you had wine, and it didn't take very long for suddenly it would turn into vinegar. So really the history is about how to prevent that from occurring. Now, the first beverages that were alcoholic, and the, the earliest trace of one, is in Jiahu, a Neolithic village in northern China and it dates back to over 7,000 BCE. And what was it? It was a drink, a combination of Emeralensis uh, uh, grape, Vitis Emeralensis, and rice, which probably was cooked, chewed, and spat out, and uh, mead, honey. And so uh, it had other elements like Hawthorne, and et cetera. And Patrick McGovern, a leading um, biochemist, uh, archaeologist, who uses uh, spectrographic analyses, etc., definitely um, the main author was actually invited to China to uh, get samples and do the studies at University of Pennsylvania. And um, why did they blend all these things to probably maximize the alcohol that they could get? And they were flavored with other things to prevent the, the, the beverage from turning into vinegar. And you see the same things occurring in the Middle East, in, in the cradle of uh, wine making. And you also see that there were drinking tubes. So there was this probably uh, had a lot of stuff in it. And all you wanted was the liquid to give you a buzz. And the other thing is that primarily all over the world, uh, you know, where wine was being produced, you know, in this Neolithic period, you had uh, it, it, the, the shards, the remains, uh, traces of wine are found along with funerary and, and sacred uh, artifacts. So how did, how did you figure out how to slow down uh, the wine from getting into vinegar? Well, 
uh, adding ingredients. Uh, if, you know, very typically, uh, wine traces that have been found 3,000, 4,000 BCE would have frankincense myrrh added to it, resins from different trees. They knew to seal uh, the particular uh, jars that uh, held the wine because they understood that more air got to it the faster this progressed. Um, they would bury the uh, containers into the ground. They would uh, select higher acidic uh, wines because acid is a preservative. They would leave residual sugar. Sugar is a preservative. And later on, fortification was a critical element. So here are uh, you know things that I, you can read for yourself, but you know you look at Georgia, Iran, and Sumeria. Sumeria, most of the wine was probably from dates, but uh, they got wines from uh, the, the uh, Sagros Mountains. Uh, so from from Iran, what we call Iran today. Um, where wine really developed into much more of a successful art form was in Canaan, uh, later uh, becoming Phoenicia. And then in ancient Egypt, they imported their wines for hundreds of years until they took over Canaan after the Battle of Megiddo and took Canaanite viticulturalists and winemakers and started to develop their own uh, vineyards. Um, wine spread by Phoenicians to ancient Greece uh, via Cyprus and Crete to begin with. Uh, in, in ancient uh, India, there are references, uh, I believe uh, nine, although some people say as many as 16, that reference some kind of alcoholic beverage dating back to 1700 BCE. Uh, of course, the Greeks settled the Mediterranean and went to Gratia Magna, the southern part of, uh, of, of Italy. And uh, there was another culture, which, which is where Tuscany uh, is, uh, called the Etruscan culture. It, there's still a lot of conjecture as to the uh, origin of the Etruscans. But they had wine, and of course, we'll look at ancient Rome. And then, you know, going back to the sacred, you know, to this day, uh, you know, uh, you have the Kiddush for uh, Shabbat, the blessing of the wine. Uh, wine in Christianity is central, and actually, uh, wine or alcoholic beverage in Islam is still key because it's prohibited. Why? because it's too sacred for human beings to imbibe. But when you go to heaven, if you get there, there are rivers of wine, because at that point, you can handle it, okay? I won't go into all the reasoning uh, conjectures for why they ended up there, but uh, date wine was a problem for the early Arab societies. Um, so, why do so many distinct varieties develop so fast? Because they found, found with this hermaphrodite uh, uh, vitus that if you planted it in a different climate, in different soils, etc., it would mutate into something else. Why? Because uh, it's genetically very unstable. Okay? So, to uh, protect its genes, if you will, if you're planting uh, grapes at the altitude of eight to 10,000 feet in Salta in Argentina, the skins are thicker to try to protect the grape uh, genes from the ultraviolet uh, rays of the sun. And uh, so you do a comparison between the same varieties that are grown there to others. And there are differences that have developed in a relatively short time. Okay, uh, just one more thing about Jahu. Uh, Patrick McGovern uh, teamed up with Sam Calajon, basically giving him what he thought was the recipe for this thing, and Sam Calajon of Dogfish Brewery, uh, you know, from Delaware, created uh, Chateau Jahu, uh, which is kind of, you combine. Uh, anyway, 
Uh, and quickly about knowing the flood or the Gilgamesh myth, which appeared around 5600 BCE. You know, uh, the isthmus of the Bosporus, you know, supposedly the Mediterranean raised several feet, as supposedly it, uh, the oceans will rise again, and formed this waterfall and finally breaking the uh, landmass that uh, was a barrier between what is now the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. So you have war fresh water at the base of the valley, it was just a, a, a relatively small lake with Mediterranean uh, salt water on top of it. And amazingly, when they sent robotic uh, submarine uh, devices below, there are uh, seemingly Neolithic type villages that are fairly intact. Okay, but to get back to the sacred element, you know, Noah supposedly landed his craft, the, the, the uh, ark, on Mount Ararat, which is in the eastern part of Turkey, close to uh, Georgia and Armenia. And what was the first thing that he did after, uh, you know, the flood, you know, as a sacrificial uh, offering? And then he planted a vineyard, which is uh, remarkable that, yes, vineyards probably started in this neighborhood. And then what had happened? He got very drunk, okay? Uh, and Hans saw him in his full nakedness, which is the English translation, but probably doesn't refer to uh, Noah's lack of clothing, but his raw emotional state. And uh, did uh, Yahweh get angry at Noah for getting drunk? No. He got really angry at uh, Ham uh, and cursed Ham's descendants, who were the Canaanites. Oh, let's see, the Jews were trying to separate themselves from the Canaanites and demonize them to the greatest extent possible. So this is the area that we're talking about. Um, uh, to date, uh, the oldest wine artifact it was found in Georgia uh, at uh, Gorish Shulpuri, and this is not that long ago, about uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and you see uh, some grapes on the, on the pot that was found. Um, and, you know, it, it's central to Georgia, and we'll take a look at that in a minute. Um, you know, but prior to that, uh, there were, they thought that the first one was in the Sagros Mountains. And now there's a site in eastern Turkey where it may be the first. We have uh, a lot more to discover. In Georgia, however, you see these great big clay jars called quevris that are buried in the ground. And you can see the tops of them on the floor of that winery. And you ferment the wine in them. And you know one of uh, the more recent fads that we're seeing are orange wines, which are white wines that are fermented on skins, which have tannin, so the texture feels a little bit different. You know, it has that dry impact on your mouth. And so um, this is all UNESCO heritage, um, cultural her heritage uh, processes. They still make the quevries in exactly the same way as they were doing, you know, probably 7,000 years ago, 8,000 years ago. Uh, Armenia, the oldest discovered winery, is in Areni, not that far away, okay, and dates back to over 4,000 BCE. And as I mentioned, the land of Canaan, which things really developed, a re reference uh, to that land in, in the Old Testament, in the Torah, as the land of Eskol being grapevines. Why? Why is it ideal? Well, there were seasons, and you know, grapevines need uh, to go dormant. And it's elevated in the Judean hills. People don't realize that you're quite high up. So what difference does that make? Well, there's a difference between daytime temperatures and nighttime temperatures. And when the grapes, no matter where they're grown, if you have that diurnal range, the acid in the grape uh, remains longer, the flavors can develop more, and the uh, development of sugars in the grape is slowed down. So 
basically it's a reference to the hang time of fruit, so you get better grapes. That's why they were uh, so well done. In ancient Egypt's maybe most famous uh, uh, allegorical work, perhaps, uh, the tale of Sinui, uh, the references to Canaan being the land of more wine than water. You know, when Moses brought his people uh, out of Sinai and he sent 12 spies to, uh, you know, uh, to a survey of the areas, to what area they were going to grab. Uh, two uh, uh, of his spies, including Joshua, came back with a cluster of grapes which required two people to carry on a, a lever. Uh, probably a little exaggerated, but regardless. Uh, the, the, as I said, uh, it was the wine source uh, for the earliest uh, pharaonic dynasties. Okay, until the pharaohs uh, conquered it in 1456, and that lasted until the end of the Late Bronze Age, which was the collapse of the Late Bronze Age, probably due to climatic changes that resulted in droughts, which resulted in the Western seafaring people invading all of those areas and breaking down these elaborate trade connections between the leading uh, powers at that time. Uh, and it's pinpointed to 1177, although some academics say, well, you're reading the calendar wrong, it's really 1186. I don't know. Anyway, uh, the oldest wine cellar to date is found in Israel, in the land of Canaan, uh, dates back to 1700 BCE with 40 jars. You see a photograph here with a capacity of 50 liters each. That's about 12 gallons. And what is other traces, well, pistachio tree resin, mint, cinnamon bark, juniper berries, uh, etc. The land of Canaan, which became uh, Phoenicia, uh, you know, is known uh, for Ugarit, which is in northern uh, Syria, which uh, was a leading wine export center, especially to Cyprus and Crete and uh, other places in the Mediterranean. Uh, the origin of the 30 character alphabet, and a lot of the tablets are all about their wine trade. And you see here what uh, their uh, Canaanite jars look like, that over time became the better known shapes of the more elongated amphora for transportation. But libations to deities for all the local religions was central and affected other cultures. It referenced 280 times in the Bible, more than any food or beverage, and it was seen as a gift from Yahweh. And Israel was the vineyard, and Yahweh was the vintner. Uh, with Christianity, that no longer held because it was uh, God who was the vineyard, and Christ was the vintner. So opening up religion to beyond the tribes of Israel. Uh, it's interesting to note that during the St. James version of the Bible and the, the origin story of the Garden of Eden, they translated the word that uh, most Hebraic uh, scholars would say just means fruit to apple. Why? Because the word malice and malus, apple and evil, were kind of, uh, you know, homonyms, so that's why they decided to use the word apple. But it was probably fruit, and most likely a grape, and uh, let's not forget that the Canaanites worshipped uh, serpents, they thought them uh, as uh, a deity, and so if you want to demonize the, the area of the people that rule the area that you're going to take, uh, you know, uh, you got to demonize them. Okay, so the Phoenicians worked the entire Mediterranean and bring the wine culture with them, extending all the way to Portugal and Algeria. And of course, Carthage is uh, really uh, the, the later Phoenician em empire. Um, and these are all the places that I indicated uh, where wine was brought to, including France, just a, a little bit, uh, the ancient Greeks. Uh, followed up quite quickly. Um, but there was wine being produced in all these areas. 
And Wang was introduced to the girls who really fell in love with it because, you know, uh, all of what's now France and uh, Spain and the rest of Europe were beer drinkers, prodigious beer drinkers. Okay, in, in Egypt, it had a sacred aspect. It was pretty much relegated for use for religious festivals, uh, priestly class, and of course the aristocracy that was associated with the priestly class. Uh, wine was viewed as medicine. Uh, you would add herbs, etc., to it to extract the compounds needed to make you feel better. Um, and, you know, for example, 700 wine jars from Canaan buried at Scorpion first uh, burial site. And they have all these other ingredients. Uh, they use a pergola trellis system, which is still used in various places, especially where it's hot, because you have to protect the grapes from sunburn. Uh, you can see those uh, jars uh, have holes in the tops, because obviously if it's fermenting, CO2 is escaping, and you don't want it to uh, blow up your jar. Uh, the tablets that were labels that were adorning the particular urns included the variety, the vintage, the producer, and the vineyard. How much, how far we've come in 4,000 years, okay? There may have been cork usage, uh, but there's no definitive uh, proof of it. Uh, Shesmu, the god of the wine press, that uh, was the sort of intermediary with Osiris that uh, would go through his resurrection, um, you know, was also uh, the god of uh, sort of craziness, probably associated with wine. If you drank too much of it, uh, what would happen? Chaos. Well, you know, the wine press uh, uh, is depicted as for evildoers, they would be put in the wine press and crushed, okay? Which is also a, 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 a similar finding that you find in the Old Testament where uh, God could punish uh, those who didn't follow his laws in a wine press, okay? Um, I, I'm, in Mycenaean uh, Greece, when they got the wine from uh, the Canaanites and the Phoenicians, it became central to their culture. Uh, and, um, you know, for those of you that remember your Homer, uh, you will see that uh, by not, you know, Homer in the Iliad is talking about the Achaeans and the uh, siege of Troy, and they forget to offer a libation to the gods, and Zeus punishes the hell out of them, okay? So it's still got the sacredness, but at the same time, you have the crater, the large jar from uh, that uh, Mycenaean uh, period, where wine, was added to water, not water to wine, okay, wine. It, this practice probably started in Phoenicia where uh, sources of uh, water were limited and, you know, as you had uh, development of human settlements, what would happen? Well, the effluents coming from human settlements would pollute the waters and people would get typhus and other t uh, cholera, blah, 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 blah. blah. And so, what did they learn? Well, if you added 50% wine, or even later a third wine to two thirds water, and left it for a couple of days, you could drink the water without getting sick, okay? And this is the start, if you will, from the non-sacred, and the Greeks, from that point on, always diluted their wine for drinking purposes. Uh, pure wine was used for medication, for extracting compounds from different plants and uh, spices, was used for embalm embalming fluid, was used when uh, they were wounded from battle, same thing for the horses, they would use pure wine, okay? But it was always water first and then wine, why? Because they were interested to make sure that the water was a-okay the barbarians, which come from the ancient Greeks, people that you didn't understand, so they said they'd go ba 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 and that's how barbarians originate, also drank undiluted wine, okay? 
Uh, but why did wine take off in Greece? Because of the topography, the soil, the climate. They're ideal for uh, uh, vineyards, not for growing cereals. Okay, yes, there's a, one plain in, in central uh, Greece, but by and large, it's an extremely mountainous place, and it's not conducive to that much, uh, of, and the soils just didn't have the nutrients. But the vines don't need it, neither do olive uh, trees. So their, their growth depended on, uh, and their power emanated from their trade of wine in particular. And of course you have Dionysus, who is the resurrected, he would be resurrected every spring, and uh, was connected to wine and wine drinking. And he was uh, sort of the intermediary between God and men. And, uh, you know, in Symposia, uh, they would always drink diluted wine, and you'll see all the artifacts. But Greece, you know, not only traded, they colonized so much, including what's uh, Campania and southern Italy, uh, Sicily, uh, Massalia, which becomes Marseille, all the way actually to uh, southern Portugal and uh, where Jerez is in Spain. So a, a major factor, I mean, you've got uh, Bulgaria, which uh, is not well known to the West, but makes awesome wines along with Romania. They've been growing wines there for almost, uh, you know, two and a half thousand years. They recognized varieties, how to train vines properly, how to space them, how to prune them. They realized that with sweet wines, and the methodology for making sweet wines is practically the same today that it was for, at that time, um, because sugar is preservative. So if you wanted a wine to last uh, years and years and years, if they had a high concentration of sugar, uh, then, you know, the wine would last. And how did they do this? They did it by uh, either drying uh, the grapes on the canes or uh, harvesting them, laying them out on mats, and letting the sun slowly dry them, a practice that is still used today. Uh, they talk about the white flour, which was the growth of a secondary yeast after the fermentation that would coat the surface of the wine, which is what sherry is all about. And that yeast actually consumes alcohol, but it acts as a barrier against oxygen, thereby preserving the wine. That, that floor can survive for a number of years. Um, the first laws were introduced at that time, including uh, one of Draco's laws, grape stealing would result in death, okay? Um, so I, I've explained why sweet wines, uh, one of the areas uh, where it's uh, famous is sent to the island of Santorini, which uh, actually uh, blew up many times, but the last time, was uh, resulted in the end of the Minoan civilization, created huge tsunamis, affected the climate in the whole eastern Mediterranean, and we still haven't uh, connected all the dots as to why some of the changes occurred at that time. Uh, the method for growing grapes, you can see uh, they can actually lie on the ground and the canes are forming a basket. It's uh, pretty cool. Um, the more artifacts, artifacts you have, the more you see how central wine is to a culture. Well, the pitoys, they're huge. You see somebody standing next to one in the museum. The pitoy would be buried in the ground. Why? Because the temperature is 50, 55. Once it's buried there, the perfect system. If you have a wine cooler, it's set at 50, 55, okay? Uh, it's a perfect way to preserve your wine. Um, and forests were only used for transportation. Uh, the crater I've already referred to, uh, the top right, is where the mixing of uh, water and wine, uh, uh, called crasis. Uh, they had ladles with a cup on it that looked like a Venencia that's used in Jerez. They had different wine drinking vessels from bowls uh, to uh, the bottom left uh, is a um, kylix, okay, which you would see uh, depicted most often, 
but they had two handled cups, uh, the, the um, oinokoia, which uh, was a pitcher that you see depicted the transfer of the wine from a crater to uh, somebody's kylix, etc., and even the water cooler. And lastly, they, they, uh, we don't know enough about the kaikion, which were the first cocktail which uh, were used in the Eleusinian mysteries. Uh, it included barley, which may have developed the fungus ergot, which, you know, if uh, you know some Roman history, uh, the reason that the Romans built Hadrian's Wall to keep those crazy Celts out is because when they went into battle and before they painted themselves all blue, they drank ergot laced beer, which is hallucinogenic, so it's kind of like Monty Python. Oh, take this arm, I got another arm. Take that arm, we don't care. And they're the only people that really frightened the hell out of the Romans. <laughs> um, in any case, so as I mentioned, the Greeks settled uh, in, in uh, Magna Graecia, uh, and wine goes from strictly the semi-sacred uh, element to a consumer product. Why? Because the Romans were fantastic engineers, both social and physical engineers, and they could bring water from more than 100 kilometers away to Rome, fresh spring water, uh, you know, serving over a million inhabitants, and so they didn't have to worry about, oh, well, does the water have, uh, you know, cholera? They didn't know it was cholera, but, you know, is it impure and are we going to get sick? No. So what happens to wine? Well, we're just going to drink it and have a good time. And they were prodigious, so much so that the Romans had to expand vineyards outside of Italy. And at one point, the production was so great that the Emperor Dom uh, uh, Domitian uh, enacted an edict forbidding any more wine being uh, planted outside of Italy. That didn't work. In any case, uh, we know a great deal about the, what the Romans did. They had a legendary vintage, 121 BCE, that supposedly lasted, the wine lasted 100 years. I don't know if that's an exaggeration. You can see the Greek influence in southern Italy and Campania. Uh, near in Naples, where the Alianico grape, Alianico, Hellenic, okay, the, the Greek one, Greco di Tufo, there's a little place called Tufo, and it's the Greek one, and plenty of others. And um, one of the instrumental families was the Mastro Berardino, uh, that has an experimental uh, vineyard. They would find seeds from Pompeii and then uh, do DNA analysis, see if it's still growing and then, uh, you know, see what's, what's the wine like. So he's been at the forefront of this. And then as they expanded into France where they were using barrels, they start using barrels because one person could roll a barrel down holding, you know, five times the amount that even an amphora could, and an amphora required two people, and an amphora would break fairly easily. Uh, you know, in Pompeii, there were 130 wine bars for 10,000 people, okay? So that means that Winter Park, by that ratio, should have, you know, 300 wine bars. What the heck is wrong here? Anyway, uh, the Romans planted everywhere uh, that they conquered. Uh, their uh, leading agricultural text of book, De Re Rustica, was used until the Middle Ages. Um, and. Uh, you know, uh, I always was taught that they didn't have heavy glass, but in 1867, this glass bottle was um, discovered in Speyer, Germany, and it still has liquid in it, okay? They don't want to analyze it because if they open it, they fear that the oxygen ingress will completely destroy what's in there. The, uh, but it's still remarkable. Uh, when Emperor Constantine and the Edict of Milan uh, basically enacts that uh, Christianity is the official religion of the Roman Empire, then you know, wine becomes semi-sacred again and a, a critical part. And the monks from uh, really the fourth century 
all the way until the French Revolution uh, lead the charge, if you will, to determining what are the best sites, what are the best varieties, what are the best vineyards within the locations. And the Benedictines and Cistercians were way ahead. I mean, there are notes about people, monks, tasting the soil. Uh, I think that's going a little far, but they didn't have a lot of uh, scientific instrumentation. And uh, so the church owned more and more land. I mean, the monks, you, you needed wine for communion, but you could also bribe people to come uh, to church by giving them wine, and it, it was a, 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 a means by which they became so powerful. That's not to say that uh, the uh, civil authority, uh, such as uh, Charlemagne or Karl de Corso, had a, a, a dramatic impact by selecting particular sites that are the most famous along the Rhine, the Rudersheim, uh, Johannesburg, etc. And Corton, one of the most famous vineyards in Burgundy, is surely one of the most expensive. If you can find it for less than six to eight hundred bucks, tell me about it. Um, but uh, he, uh, as an aside, his beard was supposedly reddened by the wines of Corton, and his wife got really angry about this, and so he also had white grapes planted on Corton, and that's why the Corton, which is now known as Corton Charlemagne, has both Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Okay, Leif Erikson, and you know, uh, it ended up in Newfoundland, and uh, the reference to it is uh, Vinland, but these were non vitis vinifera, as later uh, English discoverers and Spanish discoverers realize, uh, you know, not really good for making wine. Uh, didn't taste the same. The Doomsday Book that was, um, uh, that uh, William uh, the Conqueror um, required a complete accounting of who owned what land, etc. notates that there are 40 significant vineyards. Do you realize that today in England there's over 400 vineyards and over 40 uh, wineries? This is why we know that climate is having an impact. Uh, in Italy, the Chianti uh, is mentioned. The Riccasoli family owns the Castello di Broglio, which you can find. So it's been in the same family since uh, even before 1140. Malvasia was the dominant wine of the Eastern Mediterranean during the Byzantine era from the 10th to the 17th century. And uh, it, the word uh, Malvasia comes from Monemvasia, which is a fort, uh, single island. It means actually single gate. And it, it, it really is a style of wine, a sweet wine that the Venetians spread all over the Mediterranean. And they corrupted it from Monemvasia to Malvasia. And the English corrupted uh, Malvasia to Malmsey in uh, Madeira. In 1152, uh, critical to wine trade, uh, Eleanor of Aquitaine married uh, Henry II of uh, Plantagenets. The English uh, ruled uh, for over uh, 400 years the southern uh, west part of France, and you know they no longer could grow wines as successfully as the climate got colder. And so they uh, used Bordeaux, create a, a major wine importing center, if you will. In 1224, there's a poem by Henri Dandel that uh, in the court of the French king, uh, they had uh, the Battle of Wines, uh, early wine competition, and the best wine was the Commanderia from Cyprus, another sweet wine. In 1299, Arnaldus de Villanova, Arnaud uh, Villeneuve, uh, served as physician to the king of Majorca that ruled not just the island of Majorca, but the Basque lands in southern France across Languedoc, extending into Italy. Uh, he started using um, mutage. He distilled wine into spirits and added the spirit to unfermented or fermenting wine so that they would be stable and sweet, okay? Uh, Madeira wine first is not fortified, but 
the Portuguese and others used barrels of Madeira wine as ballast, and they would leave it in the hold of the ship for a couple of years, and then, especially the English captains, would uh, sell them to people in Charleston, and with time, they found it much easier to replicate uh, this uh, long sea voyage uh, by adding more spirits to it, more spirits, more spirits, stabilizing it further. And, you know, people of Charleston, Savannah, love this stuff. And why? Because most wine that was being imported from France or wherever just didn't make the journey well because the sea voyages would uh, cause uh, whatever bacteria to start changing the wine and oxygenating it and oxidizing the wine quicker. Uh, wines were planted in the Americas uh, first in Mexico, in Chile in uh, 1548 by Pizarro, in um, Argentina on the uh, western side in Santiago de Estero by Cidron, uh, Padre Cidron. And interestingly, the grapes that were planted in, say, California or the southwest uh, by uh, the Spanish monks and uh, called Criolla in, in, in Argentina and Pais, they're all the same grape. They are the Lista Negro that comes from the Canary Islands. Okay? Um, the first botricized uh, wine occurs in Tokai. This is uh, a sweet wine because the fungus would attack the grapes, penetrate the skins, the uh, skins uh, uh, allowing uh, the uh, water in the grape to slowly evaporate, and the grape starts to shrivel, and the sugar content becomes higher and higher and higher. It happened uh, during an attack by the Turks, the Ottomans, and they weren't able to harvest in time, but instead of just throwing them out, they made a paste uh, and uh, made a spectacular wine from it, and it became known as the King of Wines and Wine of Kings. Barolo also uh, claims that nomenclature as well, uh, as do other wines. In England, a key element was the development of the coal industry. They banned charcoal because they needed the wood for ships, okay? But once you had coal, you could have a higher, uh, uh, much hotter fire, and you could anneal glass in a different way to make it stronger. And so the English preceded the continent by 70 years. They tried to keep it secret longer, but they didn't. And so glass starts to enter the world of wine as a method for uh, selling it. It wasn't the primary way, you, you know, until recently, and I'm talking about less than 100 years ago, you would go to bars, etc., in France, and they'd have barrels of wine, and you would come with your bottle and you would fill up the, the bottle, okay? Only the highest end wineries would do some bottling at their own uh, facilities. The British, who have actually the longest known treaty that's still in existence today uh, between two countries, Portugal and England, dates to 1386 and it's been called into service even in, in World War II and beyond. Um, but the Treaty of Methuen established English port houses in uh, Porto. In um, South Africa, it's a victualling station, primarily for the English, okay, very important. French Huguenots settled there. There's an area called French Hook. They develop a fantastic wine, but most, and it's sweet, and it can be uh, more of a preservative. So why the spread of fortified wines? They're all based on the English demand for a stable wine. They couldn't grow it themselves, and so Jerez is fortified either after fermentation or during fermentation so that it's sweet. Madeira, same thing. Port, same thing. South African wines, Australian wines, and Marsala was actually created by an English admiral in, during the Napoleonic Wars. Before then, Marsala was a good, uh, uh, dry wine. Uh, the Spaniard king tried to stop uh, wine production in the New World to protect the Spaniard wine industry. Um, Constantia, as I said, that comes from South Africa and was the favorite wine of many of the kings of uh, Europe. 
um, and repeated efforts to plant grapes here in this country failed. They didn't know why, but it was phylloxera, this root louse that would happily grow on American vitis, whether it's Balandiera or any of the others, by surviving uh, little colonies on the underside of grape leaves, okay? But they couldn't survive. So with steamship transportation and scientists being interested in the botanical life that was in the New World, they accidentally brought cuttings of American vines to France that harbored some of the phylloxera. And the phylloxera there went, we can't survive off the underside of the leaves and suck the sap that way. But boy, the roots taste great. And they decimated all the vineyards of Europe. Okay? Now that's a little bit later than this. The French Revolution had huge consequences. One, the monks were out of the wine business. Okay? All the lands were taken over. And so you have the rise of the négociants who were up to that time basically wool merchants, etc. And so you know the names today, Jadot, uh, uh, Favelet, uh, I mean a, a host of, uh, of different names. Um, that's why that came about. And the other thing that was critical was the Napoleonic Code of Inheritance. Equal inheritance. So if you own 50 acres because you were supportive of the revolution and you got 50 acres and you had four surviving adult children, they uh, would each get a quarter and their children would each get an uh, equal share, etc. So now if you go to France and Burgundy in particular and you say, oh, you own some of the Clos de Vougeot, what do you have? Oh, I have the 16th row. Uh, I share it with my sister and my cousins. Okay, well, you can't make wine just from a small part of a row. So what do you do? You go to Nicosian, who uh, you know, basically makes the wine for you and then gives you uh, a, a corresponding uh, amount. Um, I'll skip that. Um, the other thing that uh, came to uh, France uh, and the rest of Europe from uh, our country was a fungus known as powdery mildew. And it was a disaster. It took uh, quite a long time for them to figure out that sulfur, uh, spreading sulfur on the uh, vines, uh, prevented uh, its 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 success. 1855, the World's Fair in Paris was the start of the Bordeaux classification. <laughs> now, uh, Bordeaux had started branding, and the first uh, brand that was well known was O'Brien in Samuel Pepys's diary. Aubryon, one of the, at that time, four premier crews later joined in the 20th century by Mouton Rothschild, because money talks. Um, in this country, as a, we've already gone over the native varieties that don't make a good wine, beer, rum, whiskey, that was our culture. Um, it was therefore used, viewed as an elite beverage and you know, even though Jefferson tried, he brought the best vines, he brought uh, the best viticulturalists he could find in Italy, etc. It was uh, to no end. On the west coast, they didn't have phylloxera because phylloxera is east of the Mississippi. So uh, wine production, once you know the gold rush takes place, etc., they've built upon it. Uh, Zinfandel uh, becomes a major. Uh, piece of it uh, through DNA analysis in the 1990s. Uh, uh, Anne Noble discovered that Zinfandel had the same DNA as Kralniak Kastelansky from Croatia, and it's identical to Primitivo in the Puglia on the uh, east coast of Italy. Um, Agustin Harasti brought tens of thousands of cuttings, and people lost track of what the hell they really had. So it was uh, mislabeled in so many ways. But in 1862, there were all, already over 8 million vines growing in California. And then, with the trains coming and then phylloxera strikes. And on top of that, they, do, 
they had the San Francisco earthquake and fire, and San Francisco was a key market for the wines that were being produced there. Uh, in Chile, Echazareta brought vine cuttings from Bordeaux before Phylloxera hit, which was in 1862 on. And the point I would like to make about Phylloxera, it's still spreading. I went to a Greek island called Kefalonia, and they've only started seeing Phylloxera in the last 15 years. Armenia just started getting uh, Phylloxera. So, the, you know, it's, it, it's just a continual process where all the grapes vines have to be replanted. Then there was downy mildew, which uh, uh, caused one more problem. And then, um, how did they resolve it? By grafting. So almost all the vineyards in the world are grafts of Vitis vinifera on American rootstocks. And it's a, careful, it's a game that you have to play. Does this rootstock do well in this kind of soil? How much water there is, et cetera, et cetera. And does the variety that you've grafted onto it do well? Now in Chile, they don't have to graft. In Washington state, because the root louse can't survive and move in the lease, the sandy topsoil, it doesn't have phylloxera. And it's a, it's a great economic advantage if you don't have to do this grafting. Okay, vinifera was brought to China in 1891. And then because of phylloxera, the Pied Noir, the French colonists in Algeria, uh, started planting a crazy amount of grapes, so about 1,500 square miles of vineyards, sending uh, mostly Carignan being sent to France. That would be blended with the great Pinot Noirs or the Bordeaux, etc., etc., to boost their alcoholic strength. Okay? In this country, prohibition takes place. You realize that the average consumption per adult was nine gallons of spirits per year in addition to your daily cider and uh, beer consumption, daily, okay? We haven't hit that point again yet. Um, the AOC laws that are the basis of all European wine laws occurred because they had to deal with the Algerian problem, okay? They basically replanted most of the major wine areas, grafted them, and they wanted, you know, it was basically about purity. How do we prevent Algerian wines being blended into, say, Chateau Neuf du Pape, and still say that it's really a Chateau Neuf du Pape because their tradition is, it's a reflection of a set of place. And, and France was by far the most sophisticated in general in terms of creating uh, vines as an art. Uh, stainless steel fermentation is key. You wouldn't be drinking the white wines that you do that have different fruit uh, flavor um, uh, profiles if it weren't for stainless steel fermentation. What that does with temperature control is you can replicate the areas where it was first planted and uh, you know it's quite cool in the autumn when you're harvesting, etc. And so you can get preserved fruit flavor. And stainless steel fermentation just as allows you to carry that even to an extreme. Uh, I'll skip that because of time. Uh, in Key in uh, Napa, uh, Zellerbach, who was the U.S. ambassador to Italy, replicated a uh, the winery at, uh, at the Claude Vujo down to the oak barrels. Now the Napa Vintners Association, including Mondavi, etc. They couldn't figure out why their Chardonnays tasted so different from the great Burgundies. Well, when they tasted Hansel, made by uh, Zellerbach's people, they were like, what the hell is this? You snuck in some French wine here? And, then these, and you know, it was like a revelation. Oh my God, it's all about the French oak. So much different from American oak. Such a tighter grain giving you a less overt uh, flavors. So that's what happens there. Dr. Konstantin Frank, a Ukrainian who was uh, first emigrated to Canada and went to the Finger Lakes area, said, yes, you can plant Vitis vinifera here, and I'll prove it to you. And now the Finger Lakes is exploding in terms of production of fine wines. The Rieslings 
are world class, as are some of the other uh, grapes. Um, screw caps. Screw caps initially Gallo that actually changed the face of wine consumption in this country to make it a product that you would have on the table, not to think about, but just like olive oil or anything else. But uh, Gallo, the largest uh, family-held wine family that uh, produces almost 80 million cases of wine and has a host of labels that you would never recognize as Gallo because they bought them. Um, any case, they, they uh, really, it took many decades for them to move from just the Carlo Rossi's to fine wine, but they recognized that the Carlo Rossi element was going to decline over time, and so they're into fine wine production uh, overall. But they used screw caps, as did the others, and why? Well, until recently, the incidence of bad cork that is affected by bacteria was about, on average, three to four bottles per hundred. And it's uh, a bacteria that in combination with the chlorine treatment produces a compound called TCA. If I put one drop of TCA here and you came back in a month, and as long as the floor wasn't clean, uh, and you opened that door, it would hit you, okay? It, it, it basically, what it does is diminish. It can be very slight or very overt. It can overt, the wine smells like uh, you're in a dank cellar. Very lightly, you have loved this wine, always has good fruit notes, etc. You get a bottle and you're going, oh, the vintage mustn't have been very good. No, it has nothing to do with vintage. There's something wrong with the cork. If ever you come across that, just bring the bottle back to the retailer and say, this wine is corked. That's the term. Okay. Uh, uh, the one thing that happened in the 60s was wine started becoming an investment. And when you have that, guess what? Fraud soon will fall. But a key element that I'm going to mention here is the judgment of Paris. Changed everything for this country. And not just this country every non-French country. Why? So Stephen Spurrier, who just recently died, uh, was this wine, uh, I don't like using the term uh, expert or connoisseur, but he had a, a wine school in Paris, okay, because contrary to the French thinking that they just naturally assimilate all this culture, uh, you, you actually have to learn about it and uh, be educated on it. And he had a wine school, quite successful. And for the 1976 uh, biennial uh, 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 festival that we were holding here, uh, he thought, what a great idea. I'll get some California wines and uh, have a competition using f top French sommeliers, wine producers, wine reviewers, etc. And they could do a blind tasting. And so that's what happened. And guess who won? Uh, for Chardonnays against top French Burgundy Chardonnays, uh, it was Ch Chateau Montalina of California. And for the Reds, it was Stag's Leap. Okay? And, you know, the French were terribly upset. But what it caused was a wine rush. Not just to Napa, but Australians were going, geez, if those stupid Californians can do it, we can certainly do it, mighty. And, you know, uh, people in Italy were like, huh, we have much more history. If our wines, uh, we, we'll make even better wines. And so, in many ways, French wines got knocked off the pedestal. Uh, so it's a huge event. And then you have, you know, things like Wine Advocate and Robert Parker that helps to determine the price of wines. And if he gives you 100 points and you're a producer, suddenly the wine that cost 20 bucks is now 120 bucks and, you know, uh, on and on and on. Uh, and as we get more and more sophisticated, we develop this system of, like appellation system in, in Europe, called American Viticultural Areas, ABAs. And uh, other things that happened, Cloudy Bay, uh, Sauvignon Blanc in, in, from New Zealand, 
not once, but twice in a row in the mid 80s is viewed as the best Sauvignon by far in the world. And so New Zealand suddenly is on the map and it goes from basically almost no production to whoosh, you know, being a, a, a large producer of wine. And Oregon, to uh, uh won best of show in 1984 from Oregon. Who knew? And now you have the Oregon wine rush, okay? Uh, then you have other things like 60 Minutes and the French Paradox, where the increase in wine was 40% in consumption. And then, oh no, Philoxera strikes the second time because the University of California, Davis, uh, unfortunately recommended a rootstock that had Vitis vinifera uh, DNA in it, and the Philoxera adapted and said, oh, these are yummy. So they had to replant all of Napa and Sonoma, 90% of it. Then you have Sideways, the movie, which you may have seen, but Pinot Noir takes off. I won't tell you about my conspiratorial theory about that. And then you've got fraud cases in which uh, people like Bill Koch are defrauded out of tens of millions of dollars of uh, fake wines. And now, uh, you know, what, what do we have? Well, climate is definitely changing things. Uh, there's an allowance to grow different varieties in Bordeaux, including Chardonnay and Syrah. They're not allowed to put the name Bordeaux on it yet, but they realize that things are changing. Um, in, in Germany, they see how dramatic the effects are. They used to only have one out of ten vintages that was any good. Now it's nine out of ten that are great vintages. Um, uh, and there are changes to the method in which you plant and, and grow grapes because of climate. Uh, you see champagne houses investing more and more in southern England where the limestone uh, substrata is uh, uh, exactly the same as uh, what's in Champagne. Um, and so where would I say we are right now? There's no excuse for any bad wine. Uh, in this country, you're allowed to add up to 50 different ingredients natural ingredients, natural, including water, because oh, my wine is uh, coming in at 16 and a half natural uh, alcohol. Uh, consumers won't like that, so I'll just add some water to it and dilute it. Okay, two, my wine, you know, people like darker looking reds, so I'm gonna add a compound called Mega Purple to make it look darker. Okay, um, there's many, many different things. But what we've had is a reaction to 60 years of industrial wine production and homogenization, and people going, you know what, if I want to find my place in this crazy market, you know, I gotta, I, I gotta give my wine a sense that it comes from a particular place and tastes differently because it was made here. So you're having kind of a reversion going back to uh, an early European uh, time, so that it has this expression of terroir. You have natural wine. People are very concerned about it. I mentioned already that uh, the wine world was way ahead of uh, the rest of the agricultural world, and uh, you know you see organic. You, you, it's really hard to have organic wines. We have our wines made from organic grapes because it precludes you from using uh, sulfur, which prevents bacteria from infecting your wine, even at trace levels. So for the most part, it's organic grapes that uh, lead to uh, the wine. Uh, orange wine I've already mentioned, which has become a bit of a craze where people are fermenting in huge clay and uh, uh, quivery like things. We have a rosé craze, although somebody I know in the business that imports a lot of rosé says that the market is already going bust. I'm not convinced of that, maybe a regional thing. Uh, and unfortunately, we see a disappearance of sweet wine traditions, which you know, is my intention to, to really focus on the stories behind all of these wonderful wines and why they should still play a role, but people are worried about you know, having sh sugar, et cetera, even though they're perfectly happy to have delicious sweet pastries from a patisserie, I don't know. Any case, 
And then you have more and more wine producers talking about old fines. It's not a legally determined thing, but old fines, basically most fines, after about 20, 25 years, they've hit their peak and most commercial wineries re replant. Okay? And, and so what are old fines? Well, some people say they've got to be 25 years or older, etc. I don't think so. Uh, old vines, for example, I took this photo. That's one vine that almost looks like it has a tree trunk. It's about 400 year old in Lanzarote in the Canary Highlands. Okay, the oldest vine is in Austria. It was uh, unfortunately attacked by, I guess, a delinquent uh, and was over 500 years of age. Um, so, coming full circle, we started with and end with, remember we start with Jiahu as a wine from China, and uh, China is uh, planting grapes like crazy. I've been to China a couple of times, and it's just mind-boggling. So uh, this shot is of how they have to bury the entire vine during winter, because the winter is coming off the Gobi Desert, would otherwise kill all their vines. So they have to go through the laborious process of actually burying all the vines, and then before spring, as things warm up, they pop them back up, and it's uh, pretty extraordinary. Anyway, I know I went way over time. Uh, thank you for your attention, and, um, you know. Thank you very much.